Cleveland. Thank you for leading us in worship. Kim and I were talking about missing worship, missing being in the presence of God. And uh, thank you, each of you that, that participating and leading us in worship today. Thank you. Last Sunday, Kim and I were in a village uh, in northern Brazil with about 125 members of a, of a, of a, a tight tribal group from Sao Gabriel, North South Gabriel. We were at a farm. Uh, farm is a terrible word to describe what this was, but it's what they use as a farm. And, and it's just a place that they've cleared out some area in the jungle. And uh, each family unit has a thatched roof, uh, a shelter of some kind, mostly with no sides, with some hammocks hanging in it. And uh, there's a little soccer field, and everybody uh, there played soccer from kids all the way up to, to senior adults. And, and people were sitting around in groups and laughing, and children were climbing uh, Asi uh, trees to get the, the fruit and uh, bananas, and uh, people were sharing pineapples and coconuts, and a lot of activity were was taking place all around a Sunday afternoon at this time because the time we were ahead of, of you there by about three hours in that part of Brazil. Well, all of a sudden, uh, a bell began to ring. And I was sitting with my son-in-law and one of the other missionaries uh, from that region. And, and we noticed the soccer game stop. People began to, to run back to their uh, thatched roof dwelling and each came out with a, a plate or a bowl or a, a husk from a tree. Uh, some of them came out with an a, a eating utensil and maybe a cup. And they all ran towards that bell. And, and, and the bell was located in a, a little courtroom about as big as what the two center sections of pews. And every person from that village sat down on the outside of, of that big circle. Inside was a table and a group of, of men. And there were several big bowls sitting on that table. And everybody sat around the outside, each with a plate or a bowl or a husk of some kind, some type of utensil and a, and a cup. And they all just sat there quiet. That, that no, no talking. It was, it was very, very quiet, very reverent. The pastor of that group stood and said some words in Portuguese, and, and my daughter translated it for me, and it was a prayer thanking God for the blessings of a meal. And he put it that way, thank you that we have today a meal. And after the prayer, the the men grabbed the, a, a big bowl, big uh, bowl full of, of, of pieces of meat that they had cooked on an open fire. And one by one, they went around everybody that was sitting there holding their plate out. And, and each time they'd stop in front of a person and they'd pull out a piece of meat, chicken or, or, or some other colored dark meat. I don't know everything that was in that bowl. Probably don't want to know everything. They pulled it out and they set it on a plate. And they went to the next person and set it on a plate. There was not any, I want a leg, not a thigh. I, his piece is bigger than my piece. None of that. It was just quiet. And they went all the way around the circle giving everybody a piece of meat. And then everybody kind of began to eat their meat. Quiet, reverent, joyful, but just a time of fellowship. And as we're eating the, the meat, then the men walked around with a big bowl of rice. And to every person, they, they would put a, a, a scoop of rice on your plate. And, and there was no, no thank you. There was no, uh, you know, I, hey, I didn't get as much as, as she got her. It was just, they just handed it out. And then they walked around with this big pot, hot, 
holding it with husks from the trees because it was so hot from being on that fire. And, and they would take a ladle and they grabbed a scoop of beans and they put it on your plate. There's 125 people sitting in a circle, everybody holding a plate or a bowl and some type of, of eating utensil, and everybody just ate. This was Sunday one week ago today at this exact moment in time. And after everybody had had time to eat, I heard the men say something, and I didn't know what it was, and, and it was this. It was, uh, we, have, we have some leftovers. If you'd like some more, raise your hand. And several people raised their hand, and they, they took that big bowl, and they gave them a little bit more of this or another piece of chicken or, or something else. And, and they finished that, and everybody ate, and, and they, they said something again, and it was, we have some left. If you'd like some more, raise your hand. And they went around until all of that food was eaten. They shared drinks that, that went from everything from uh, soda pop to something in a bottle. I didn't know what it was. And, and, and I, I, I kind of found myself uh, in the middle drinking out of my bottle of water in my pocket. <laughs> and they shared it. And we, we had a, a Thanksgiving meal. You know, when I mention the word leftovers, it sparks one of two emotions. Because there's some people that they won't eat leftovers. You eat that meal, that's the only time you eat that food, and, and you don't warm it back up. Uh, for some, though, leftovers is, is something good. One of my favorite things about Thanksgiving is the leftovers. Uh, this morning... What God has laid upon, uh, upon our hearts today and, and, and this, this, the time of worship that we just had e echoed this idea is that you and I have Thanksgiving leftovers. Now, I'm talking about the food. You, you may still have ham or turkey or, or uh, chicken and dressing or uh, uh, sweet potatoes. Uh, you, do I have your mouths watering yet anyway? You may have something like that in your refrigerator, but that's, that's far from where my mind is this morning. If, if, I, could, if I could say in a sentence or two what, what God has laid upon my heart today, it is this, that we have so many blessings in our life. We have so much for which to be thankful that there is no way one day a year can handle the amount of thanks that we should give. There's no way that we should just have Thanksgiving one time a year. I would say to you that we should have Thanksgiving leftovers enough that, that we find a way. As Cleveland said a while ago from 2 Thessalonians 5.18, to be thankful in all situations, for this is the will of God. For us, Thanksgiving leftovers. Find in your copy of God's Word, the book of, of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in the New Testament, fourth gospel. And in particular, would you find chapter 6, John chapter 6. There are only two miracles in the Bible that are recorded in all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The other one it's what you and I are about to read. It's a story. I had the privilege this past week of telling this story, not preaching, but telling this story to a group of guides from an indigenous group in northern Brazil that uh, as our missionaries are at work in Brazil, uh, they are hiring these guides to take them deeper and deeper into the jungle. They are learning English, and I had the privilege of telling this story to those two guides that, that are helping us take the good news of Jesus Christ into the, into the, the, the jungles of Brazil. John chapter 6. I'm not going to ask you to stand because I want to point out a couple of things as I read, but I do ask that you give your attention to the reading of God's Word for it is truly His inspired words. John 6 verse 1. If you're there, say, I'm there. 
I'm reading from the New Living Translation. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias, and a huge crowd, pause for just a second, and think in your mind what a huge crowd is. A huge crowd could be anything from a few more than you to a country. Figure in your mind this idea of Jesus and a big, huge crowd. Let's see how big. Keep reading. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw miraculous signs when he did things like heal the sick. And Jesus, then he climbed up on a hill and he sat down with his disciples. Oh, it was nearly time for the Passover celebration. And Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming again to look for him and turning to Philip, one of his disciples. He said, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Verse 6, he was testing Philip for he already knew what he was going to do. Pause for just a second. I love the fact that there's this big crowd following Jesus. They can't get enough of Jesus. They, they don't want to go home. We don't know how far they were from home, but they didn't care. They could not get enough. And Jesus already knew, because he knows all things, he already knew what he was about to do. Because you and I have read this story. I know what he's about to do, and you know what he's about to do. But the two indigenous guides from northern Brazil that I told this story to this past week had no clue as to what Jesus was about to do. My prayer is that we're surprised at what Jesus is about to do. That we don't take this miracle. It's the only other miracle than the resurrection that's in all four Gospels. That we don't take it lightly. Let's keep reading verse 7. Philip, I love him. He's a common sense kind of guy. He said, even if, if we were to work for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, hey, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves of, of bread and two fish. But what good is that with such a huge crowd? Hey, that's pretty common sense, wouldn't you agree? I mean, you got a, you got a, a, a few pieces of the bread and a couple of fish, and you've got a huge crowd that's been following Jesus so much so that they've forgotten time. It's not like they, they just skipped a meal. They, they, some of them could have been with Jesus for more than a day. And Andrew says, all we got is this little sack lunch. What good is that? That's a common sense question. Well, Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. Tell everybody to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes, and the men alone numbered about 5,000. All right, pause. Now we're getting an idea of how big this group was. But notice that it says the men alone, which means what? Say it out loud. That there were women. Who else was there? Children. Large families. Ancient cultures helped populate the world. It wasn't just one or two child, child, children per family. It was many children. This is a big group. I'm going to throw a number out there. I'm going to call it 20,000. I don't know how big it is. We're not given the exact amount. To me, that's a big group. 20,000 people. All right, let's keep reading. And then Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks to God and he distributed it uh, to the people. And afterwards, he did the same thing with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And after everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. That is so cool. Because I would say to you this, and I'll say it again in just a little while. If you and I have a chance to thank God for something and we don't, that's a wasted moment. If I've got a blessing from God in my life and I don't tell him, Thank you for that blessing. I wasted that moment in time, of which I'll never get back. I love the fact that Jesus said, gather it all. Don't let anything be wasted. Now let's finish our reading, verse 13. So they picked up the, the pieces and they filled 12 baskets with the leftovers from the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves and fish. 
And when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they all exclaimed, surely he is the prophet, the son of God that we have been expecting. Pray with me, would you? Father, don't let us waste any opportunity to give you thanks for what you do for us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. What a cool story. I hope you didn't just fast forward to the, to the end when you saw what it was and say, oh, yeah, Jesus, he feeds 5,000 plus men with a, with a sack lunch. Listen, I don't know what your Thanksgiving was like, but I would imagine if 19,050 more people showed up at your house, it would be a big deal. And you had a spread laid out. You had turkey and dressing and all the fixings. If a large, huge crowd showed up, that would be a big deal. Friends, please don't let the feeding of the 5,000 not be a big deal. This is huge. This is something that you and I can't do. Now, I know there's many things in the Bible all the things that Jesus did in, in a miraculous way are things that are out of our power to be able to do. I'm not ex excluding any of them. I'm just saying let's spend a few moments in this story and let it be a big deal to us like it was to the two Indian guides that I shared it with this past week. I want to point out three truths to us this morning from this passage of Scripture that's not a normal circumstance Thanksgiving meal. That's not an everyday kind of thing, something that is, is big. I just want to point out three things. Please grab these three. Because from these three, I'm going to challenge us to have Thanksgiving leftovers every day of the rest of our lives. Cleveland's prayer this morning was, was right on, on track. God, let today be a day that changes our heart. This is where gratitude comes from. Gratitude doesn't come from here. Gratitude comes from here. It comes from my heart. Lord, let this be a day that changes our heart about, about thanksgiving. Three truths. Truth number one, God can use any person. Any person. I, 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 as I look through this text, I, I don't know the exact makeup of the group, nor do you. But I have to, to imagine that there were all kinds of people in this group. I, I have to imagine that there were some very successful people in this group. Maybe, maybe uh, families that owned businesses from the surrounding area. Probably some that had more than others. I, I, have, to, I have to imagine that there was probably some very influential people. There was probably some people in here that didn't even believe in Jesus but they were curious as to what was going on. How was this guy getting people to follow him around for days at a time? I have to think that there were some people in here that probably felt like the least of these. The down and out. Those just looking for, for some hope. Kim and I boarded a plane in Sao Paulo heading to, uh, to Manaus on our way to see our children. And I'd picked up a New York Times newspaper and I'd read it and, and read it and read it and read everything and the only thing that was left was the New York Times crossword, of which I hate doing it because it just reminds me of how much I don't know. <laughs> and I was hung up on this word. I was hung up on a five-letter word for missed opportunities. Missed opportunities, five-letter word. And I'm just racking my brain, and I'm agonizing, thinking, come on, Donnie, figure, it's just five letters. And I, I start doing some, it was, it was a 22 across, and, and there were a bunch of up and downs that were associated with it. And I, I started going back and forth between them, trying to figure it out. And one of the flight attendants walked by, nice-looking young man, uh, uh, in shape. He kind of looked over there at me doing the crossword puzzle, and and he looked at my face, and he looked back at the crossword puzzle, and he, and he looked at my face, and he said to Kim, he said, he said, y'all from America? And Kim said, yeah. And he said, oh, and he smiled, and he went about his business. And after they had served us what they called a meal, 
he came back. And there was nobody sitting in front of it. And he stepped up on with his knees to the seat in front of us. Leaned over, very close proximity to where we are. And he said, so what do you think about your president? And we began to talk, Kim doing most. I'm still trying to find a five-letter word for uh, wasted opportunity. But she begins to tell him that, you know, it's so much bigger. The world is so much bigger than who's running for president or who's in charge. And at one point of the conversation that lasted well over an hour, at one point, Kim said, but, yeah, that's, that's beside the point because, because we have hope in God. And I wasn't, I wasn't engaged in the conversation, but I heard him say back to her with a much sterner voice, what did you say? And she said, we have hope in God. And he laughed. And he said, <laughs> He said, I think God's forgotten about us. And Kim unleashed. <laughs> she, brought, she brought Jesus Christ right into that conversation and began to tell that man that, hey, God's not forgotten about anybody. How it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter circumstances. God's Word tells us that He knows us and that he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. We sang just a second ago. He, he felt like he was the least of these. There were some in that group that had to feel like the least of these. And one of them could have been a little boy with a sack lunch. But who did Jesus choose to use? Remember, this wasn't all by accident. Remember, Jesus, I stopped you. And I said, notice that Jesus knew what he was about to do. He knew that the little boy was there. I'll be honest with you, I think there was more food in that group. Some of the disciples were fishermen. I've been with fishermen. We always have a snack tucked away. I think they had food. But who did God use? Was it the most influential? Was it the most successful? It was the one that wanted to be used. Truth is, God can use any person. Regardless of your age, God can use you. Regardless of your stage in life, God can use you. Regardless of, of your particular circumstance right now, God can use you. No one is excluded from that. No family is excluded from that. But Donna, you don't know my family. I don't know a thing about this little boy. All I know is that he had a little bit of bread and a couple of sardines, fish about the size of sardines, and God chose to use him. God chose to do a miracle that's never been done before. I don't care how good of a cook you are. You can't feed 5,000 men plus the women and children that would have become with a sack lunch. But Jesus, when someone was willing to be used. When someone took what they had and gave it to God. God can use any person. Time Magazine this past uh, article, had uh, this past month had, a, had an article in it. 50 least influential people in the world. I read it on the airplane coming back. It's people that at one time were at the height of success. Some were business people. Some were athletes. Some were, were, were uh, gazillionaires. They were at the peak at one time. But this article was about those that had become the least influential. Hear me. If you don't hear anything else, hear me. In the family of God. There are no influential, unimportant people. There is only children of God. You are a child of God. You are important to God. You can be used by God. 
Thanksgiving leftovers. You're important to God. Truth number two. God can use anything I give him to do whatever he wants to with it. God can use anything I give him and do whatever he wants to with it. I love the fact that they pointed out that this was barley bread as we read that. This doesn't mean that was the choicest of bread. This wasn't wheat bread. This was barley bread, which would have been the the bread of, of, of the poor. Barley bread is made when the poor are allowed to go into the grinding mill and scrape up the fragments that are on the ground, the leftovers, the, the, the part that will have uh, chaff in it, stalks in it. Not wheat bread, not, not, not nice cooked good loaves of, of bread. Certainly not uh, what you and I would go and, and buy at the store. Probably not like the rolls that, that, that you had on Thanksgiving Day. These were, these, were not, these were not prized cupcakes. These were, these were bread scraps. What did Jesus do with them? He fed 20,000 people. God can use anything that I give him. Interesting principle. If I've got something and I give it to God, God will bless it and then he'll give it back. And it'll be more than what I had in the beginning. That's just deductive reasoning for me. I'm just taking that straight from this story. Uh, Stay with me, stay with me. Little boy, sack lunch. He gave it to Jesus. I don't think it's by accident that the Bible says Jesus gave thanks for this. I don't think it's by accident that Jesus paused and thanked God for what he was about to do. He already knew what he was going to do. Little boy, sack lunch. He gives it to Jesus. Jesus blessed it, and then he gave it back to the little boy, but he gave it back to 19,999 other people. You apply that to any area of your life. Donnie, I don't even have enough time to to get everything that I've got done uh, to to do in a day. I don't have enough time. Here's my challenge to you. You give some time to Jesus. Let him bless it and see if he doesn't give it back to you with some despair. Donnie, I don't have enough I don't have enough money. I don't have enough. I can't tithe. I can't give to. Here's my challenge. You give to God what he asks of you. You give to him your finances and see if he doesn't bless it and give it back to you in abundance. Go read the book of Malachi chapter 3 and when you get to verse 10, read it a hundred times because there God's word tells us that if we bring the whole tithes into the storehouse, And we give it to God the way we're supposed to give it to God. That he will keep his word and that he will not just give you back what you had. But he'll open up the floodgates of heaven so much so that you won't be able to take it in. My grandfather had a famous saying. My grandfather that was a pastor. He would say, you can't outgive God because he's got a bigger shovel. Give it to God. Donnie, I've got some problems with my family. I've got, I've got, I've got some problems with in, in some relationships. Give it to God. Donnie, I can't fix it. You're right. There, none of the disciples and even that little boy that had that sack lunch, they couldn't fix this problem. Hear me. But who could? But it all started when, I'd say to you, if you've got some problems, give them to God. If you've got some situations in your life, give them to God. See if he doesn't keep his word. I'm telling you, he's a promise keeper. His word can be trusted. He he is faithful. He can be relied on. Just give it to God and see what he does. Truth number three. God can bless any situation 
in which you find yourself. God can bless any situation in which you find yourself. I made that very personal. I didn't say we there. I made it personal because I want this to ring true in our lives. Each individual, each family in us as a church body is that God can bless any situation. I love that in John's account it says that he asked Philip. Philip was from Bethsaida, which was about nine miles from where they were standing at that moment in time. Philip would have known that region. Nine miles to them was nothing. They walked it every day. If there was anywhere in that area to buy food, Philip would have known about it. Philip and Andrew and the other disciples said that this situation could not get any worse. They say we could work for months and not have enough money to buy food for this group. But yet, when Jesus walked into the situation, did it get worse or did it get better? I was, hang on. I don't know if we had 100% agreement on that. If Jesus walks into a situation, does it get better or worse? Who keeps him from walking in? Okay, now that's where we have to camp for just a minute. We've got to camp for just a minute. All we've got to sack lunch. I'm telling you, there were some of them not telling the truth. There was more food there. But Jesus wanted to show them and us that when we invite him into a situation, it automatically gets better. It doesn't mean that it's over, does it? Uh, you, you don't just feed 20,000 people like that. There were some people at the back of that group sitting way back on the back row, way back in the back, that watched people get food. And you know in their mind, because you and I would have been doing it, oh, I hope there's enough. Oh, I hope something lasts, you know, I hope there's a little bit left when it comes around for me. I hope there's, there's much. I call your attention to verse 11. Would you look back at your text at verse 11? It's my favorite verse in this whole passage. If this is not underlined in your Bible, Underline it, please. The New Living Translation in verse 11 puts the end of it like this. All ate as much as they wanted. It'll say something similar like that in your translation. Underline that. Because this is not that, that when it got to the very back row that, that there was just a little bit of crumbs left and that's all that those people got. No, those that waited the longest got just as much, hear me, as those that got it first. That's God's promise to you. Some of you have been waiting for God to, to fix something in your life, to take care of something, to repair something, to mend a relationship. Some of you have been, been battling a, a sickness or or. or or a health problem. Some of you have been in a work related. We were sitting in the airport in Sao Paulo. Two guys pulled in behind me and they began to talk about their jobs. In the oil business, not a good time to be in the oil business. They were talking, they were behind us, speaking English. Only people in Sao Paulo that spoke English were the four of us, and they didn't know we did. And they were just, they were, they were unloading to each other. One of them was talking about how he's mistreated in his job, how he's not appreciated, how he had projects that he did. Somebody else got credit for. He was up for promotion. He didn't get the promotion. Someone else that, that didn't deserve it got it. Came time for a raise. He was skipped. There was a list of about seven or eight things that this man, for an hour to his coworker, just unloaded. Never said a word. Never told him I spoke English. Never did anything. We got on that airplane. We had an 11-hour airplane ride back. When we got back out of, out of the 400 people on that airplane, Guess who I ran into while we were picking up our bags? That man. And I walked right over to him and I said, hey, I just spent the, 11 hour, the last 11 hours praying for you and your job. Expect God to do something great in your job. And ask him. It, it looked like I hit him in the face with a stick. He said, what? I said, I, I've been praying for you. I've been praying about your job. Hey, it's going to be all right. God's going to take care of you. Just trust him. And we just kept right on going. And he stared at me the whole way. I don't know if he thought I was crazy or if he believed me. 
But hear me. I'm not talking to somebody that I ran into an air, in an airport in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm talking to you and I'm talking to me. God can do anything with any situation if we'll let him. If we'll give him what we have. And we'll let him bless it. I would say to you that that's what Thanksgiving leftovers is all about. I close by, by giving, you, giving you three blessings to carry with you. These are blessings that I challenge you. If you find a way to thank God for these, and, and, and you'll, you'll have trouble stopping giving thanks. Blessing number one, be thankful that you have more than enough. Donnie, what? Be thankful that you have more than enough. Donnie, you don't know how much money I have. You're right. I'm just saying I know God. My God shall supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. But Donnie, you don't know the situation. No, nope, I, I can do all things through Christ. It gives me strength. But Donnie, you don't know what I've got. Co- You're right. But I know a God that says, I've got a plan for you. And that plan is to bless you and for you to prosper and for you to have hope and to have a future. Be thankful that you have more than enough. Today, if you sit down to a meal and there's leftovers, be thankful that you have more than enough. If you crawl into a bed tonight, be thankful that you have more than enough. If you've got anybody else in this world that knows you well and still loves you, be thankful that you have more than enough. If I, if I change the mindset of I don't have enough to what is true, that I have more than enough because I've got God, I'll have Thanksgiving leftovers. It doesn't mean I won't have any problems, and it doesn't mean I'm not going to have bad days, and it doesn't mean that the situations aren't going to creep up on me and, and catch me off guard. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means that I've got the mindset that with God, I've got more than enough. Be thankful that you've got more than enough. Blessing number two to carry with you would be be thankful for the little things in life. And we all thank God for the big blessings. If you would have won the $480,000 Powerball that played last night, I hope you didn't play. You wasted two bucks if you did. But if you won it last night, there's no doubt that you would thank God for it. There's no doubt. If suddenly you got promoted in your job, and it was a big promotion, one you didn't deserve, one you weren't planning for, but one that you got, no doubt you'd thank God. If you've been at odds with someone in your family for a long time, and suddenly God brings reconciliation because He is a God that that reconciles broken relationships, no doubt you would stop and you would thank God. My challenge is to thank Him for the little things. To thank Him for the insignificant things. To thank Him for the things that you haven't been thanking Him for. I'm convinced of this. The more I thank God for the little things in my life, the less I'll worry about the great big things. If I just thank Him here. One of my study Bibles had this. There's a lesson in the leftovers. God gives in abundance, and he takes whatever we offer him in time, ability, and resources and multiplies its effectiveness beyond our wildest imaginations. But he also does it in still, small, quiet ways. Cleveland challenged us a while ago to, to find three things that we're thankful for, surely, Surely we can do that. My grandfather also used to say, if you can't find anything to be thankful for, then thank God for something you don't have 
that you're glad you don't have. <laughs> Those are wise words. Be thankful for the little things in life. Blessing number three. Be thankful that you belong to God. Because I just, I just got back from visiting with people that they don't even know who God is. They don't even know that they belong to him. My son-in-law is, is sharing Jesus into some of the, the, the areas of the Brazilian jungles up north where they have no copy of God's word. It's not in their language. No one has, no one has written the Bible in their language. So they don't, they don't know who he is. They don't know that, that he loved them enough to send Jesus to die for them. They don't know the verses of, of, of Scripture that you and I take for granted. They have no idea that, that there is a God that loves them enough to provide eternal life for them. You're not one of them. I'm not one of them. You know you belong to God's family. Donnie, there's no way God could love me after, after what I've done. or No way God could love my family. No way God. Donnie, I have failed him so many times. 1 John 1, 9. 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 That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Would you say that word all with me? All. all. But Donna, you don't know, man, you don't know what I did last week. No, I may not, but I do know the word all. Listen, be thankful that you belong to God's family. Be thankful that you know who God is. I'm, I'm convinced. We have enough blessings in our lives that there ought not be a day goes by without it being Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving leftovers. Time Magazine had one more article, and I finished with this. It was an article that kind of told me some stuff that I did know. For instance, that, you know, uh, on most of our cell phones, there's enough information about us to to create a good profile, who we are, where we've been, banks, credit cards, family, most of our cell phones. If you have a smartphone, uh, internally, there's enough on there to create a pretty good profile. This article, though, in Time Magazine was about something a little different. Something called uh, microscopic molecular swabbings. Uh, scientists from the University of California at San Diego took a, a, a number of cell phones and they took this microscopic molecular swab and they swabbed only the outside of the phone, not internally. There's enough on the inside to, 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 to tell somebody a lot about us. But they swabbed the outside of the phone. What they found was remarkable to me. They could reveal the type of soap and lotions that you use. They could reveal the type of shampoo or makeup that you wear. They could, they, they could, they could detect the type of food that you eat. They could detect whether you were vegetarian or whether you liked meat as well. They could detect whether you like bland food or spicy food. They could detect the type of drinks that you drink. They could detect from this external swabbing of your cell phone what medications you take. All of them. They're beginning to use this data in criminal investigations, airport security, 
they're able to tell from the external swab of your phone who you've been with because of the traces of things that you leave on the outside of your phone. I immediately pulled my phone out and began to scrub it, <laughs> every part of it. I took my eyeglass cleaners and I went to town on my phone thinking if I've got that much junk on my phone, if there are that many traces, hear me, of stuff left on the outside of my phone, mercy, sex, lie, I need to clean my phone up. It's dirty. Traces of things. Hear me, and I'm done. God has left traces of himself all throughout your life. God has left himself blessings, things that, that he's given to you, things that he's provided for you, showing you how much he loves you. He's left traces throughout all of our lives. It's just that we only stop one day a year and call it Thanksgiving. I challenge you, have Thanksgiving leftovers. Have Thanksgiving leftovers. Be thankful for everything in your life and in all circumstances. For that truly is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. Would you bow your head, please?